Hello and welcome to Decoding the Gurus, the podcast where an anthropologist and a psychologist listen to the greatest minds the world has to offer, and we try our best to understand what they're talking about. I'm Professor Matt Brown, and with me is Associate Professor Chris Kavanagh, and we have a guest with us, and we know his name, but I'm not sure of his title, actually, uh, <laughs> and, and it's very important. I, I suspect it's Professor King of, all, king of all the worldly realms. <laughs> yeah. is, that above, is that above professor or below professor? I know it's associate it's, professor. <laughs> definitely below professor. <laughs> that that mel- melofi- melodious voice that you hear is the, the world-renowned David Pizarro, uh, host of this very small, obscure, uh, academic niche podcast. It's very... Very bad psychics, very bad, very bad wizards. That's it. And which he hosts with a ghost hunter and philosopher, <laughs> Tamler Summers. So David is a, a psychologist, a, a moral psychologist, is that? Or social psychologist? I, I'm a Where? social psychologist only because moral psychologist wasn't really a title when I started doing it. <laughs> but yeah, I'd say social psychologist. And, I'm, and to answer the question, associate. But there's a story behind that. I just haven't filled out my paperwork. <laughs> uh, uh, there's nothing wrong with associate professors, as, uh, even it's fine. especially it's fine. especially appointed ones. Those are right. the, the ones like you know that, that that's the title you want, the non-tenure equivalent. <laughs> um, I, and the oh, flip, um, my brain just completely spears on what I was going to say. That will be edited out. So, Matt, yeah. go ahead. We'll take that out. So thanks for coming on, Dave. Uh, we've got a, another special episode. It's always a special episode when we have a guest, but this one is extra special, 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 because we're going to get you to help us do a bit of a review of the crazy mixed up world of the Weinsteins and give everyone a bit of a, an update of what's been going on since uh, the our last episode on them. And even though... We've probably talked about them far, far too much, and we um, we don't want to be thought of as obsessives, even though Chris Arguably <laughs> is. Uh, it definitely deserves a whole episode to just see where we were and see where we are today and, and how we got there. And I want to... It, it's great to have you on in particular because the Very Bad Wizards episode 191, it was. It feels like an eternity ago, but that was around the time of the uh, Black Lives Matter protests. And there were some tweets and things there that got you guys uh, from, from <laughs> Brett and Eric that, that, that got under your skin and you hit some really good points. So do, do, do you remember that time, Dave? I do. And uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me. I would just want to say um, not only uh, am I excited to be on your podcast so I can talk to you guys and meet you because I've listened to you guys and, and have not had a chance to meet you, but to be on the Weinstein podcast episode. <laughs> I mean, the Weinstein episode, this is like, you know, this is some big shit for me. This is because uh, I've been waiting for you guys to do the episode. And here I am, like inside of it. I'm. <laughs> this is this is guru royalty. This is like being there with um, Dickham and whoever he's married with. <laughs> right. um, um, but yes, I very much remember. Um, I don't remember the content of what... <laughs> <laughs> what I said when I was upset or, or Tamler, because as, as you might feel like I just forget once we publish an episode, I forget everything um, until the emails and the tweets come in angrily. And, you know, we have been doing a podcast for a, a while, a long, a long time in, in, in podcast uh, uh, time. And we have, I think, a fairly, you know, big chunk of our following has come to us from people who first listened to Sam Harris and people who would be sort of sympathetic to the thinking of the IDW in general, which is fine. We appreciate the, them. But it wasn't so obvious to us until we said anything against them. <laughs> and then uh, all of a sudden we realized, oh, wow, there are a lot of people who are not happy with us for criticizing them. So, but yeah. Well, you you guys haven't been that shy about criticizing them though. Like in, even with, I mean, 
there's a connection which I, listeners of your podcast will know that like Tamla's stepmom is Christina Hoff Summers, right? Which is a, a very interesting and entertaining dynamic to uh, like, it, it actually makes the endless interpersonal psychodrama of the intellectual <laughs> dark web. In your, in Tamla's case, it actually is a family uh, like right. drama getting blocked on Twitter or by your stepmother or that kind of thing. <laughs> it's very, yeah, it's very close to home for him. Yes, uh, Christina has, you know, she is part of the original uh, dark picture spread of the uh, the IDW. <laughs> oh, was she in the bushes? She was in the, I think she was in the bushes. And she was, you know, she was dressed fabulously in, you know, whatever leopard, dark outfit. Leopard, she leopard, leopard print, print, that's right, that's right. Yeah. That's right. That's, That's right. Just like Brett in the same photo shoot. They, they have <laughs> yeah. matching leopard print. <laughs> there's, I, there's a, uh, this is like, this is going off topic, but I have to mention it. <laughs> I, it might even be uh, a lie, but I, I don't care. So the, the photographer who uh, posed the people for those photos, uh, I don't know. I've seen online that that photographer is skeptical of most of those figures. And that he... Oh. He partly, you know, intended the pictures to be like subtly undermining. And <laughs> if you look at the Brett Weinstein photo, it does look like he's stroking a phallic shaped shrub. <laughs> so, uh, oh I can't my say. god, I want that. That I want that to be true so badly. Yeah. Oh, that... Sometimes people accuse me of being too ad hominem, but I'm like, I'm not saying that makes Brett wrong. I'm just saying if he's stroking uh, like phallic shrubbery because of some photographer's disdain, I I would quite enjoy that. that, like, <laughs> that. The, cut yeah oh that would be you know it's like those disney animators who would who would you know secretly put in a, a phallus in two frames of a children's movie yeah, <laughs> yeah this is this is a bit like you the episode you did with the uh on the stanley kubrick like <laughs> yeah, the, the shining right. where the, it, my i you i don't think know if you've heard it but like the it's a movie about like people doing interpretations of the shining right and <laughs> right. reading and there's there's like one one guy that just was reading a lot of phallic silver cell like uh, imagery into stuff which seemed highly highly unphallic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, when, when you see dicks everywhere, maybe the problem lies with you. You know, <laughs> uh, that's uh, funny. That's funny. But yeah, no, we've not been shy in criticizing. I think, but it is important uh, to us to. Um, to always, to always, this is this is hard to do. I think, and people we may have failed miserably at times. But to to speak of people with respect, even when we're criticizing them, and yeah. there's certain pe certainly people we've disagreed with, who are I would consider friends. You know, Sam Harris included um, in that mm -hmm. in that number. And so I think that day though might represent the the time when I like had just gotten pissed off enough at some tweet that it just set me off and i don't have a relationship with either of, of the weinstein brothers of any of of the four weinstein famous weinstein brothers um <laughs> and so i certainly didn't feel any you know i didn't feel any of that oh my god they might hear this kind of uh there there was no sentiment holding me back from expressing my uh anger at at what i what I think, and I think might be a theme of what we discuss, what I view as a sort of deep irresponsibility um, about, not just about, not really about what they believe, but about what, how they are leading, like who they're leading where. Like there yeah. is a, I think in general, an, an unwillingness to deal with the problem of having followers who you know are going to misuse your information and uh, and work in ways that even you would disagree with, and um, and that's mm. that's really what I think pisses me off the most about some of these, especially lately. Yeah, yeah. I I think when they like part of the issue with the Weinstein's and the IDW world in general that like most rubs me the wrong way 
is when you present as like the secret, this as a kind of secret value that you're willing to have the hard conversations and, you know, get into criticisms and you don't care about the personal elements yeah. or the tribal factors. And then the reality is much more like most of what you see is very strongly tinged with interpersonal psychodrama stuff, right? Like <laughs> you criticize this person and they're my friend. So that, or the, this person is a bad yeah. faith actor. And it, it means oh, that term bad faith, by the way, has been uh, getting on my nerves so much. Yeah. It's it's like started off as something that that made sense as a phrase to say, and now it's just completely, completely meaningless. All it means is somebody who who disagrees with me in a way that I don't like. Like yeah, yeah. It, it's, well, it, go Matt. Yeah, well, it's a bit of a trend, is it? Where every every term, every every good thing gets weaponized and turned <laughs> into this awful imitation and charade of the good thing. And, you know, <laughs> sense-making is, is a word that triggers me now. Whenever people say yes. sense-making, it's oh, a fucking man. red flag. I, I, trade-offs. So, trade-offs. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, we can just tra trade trigger words. <laughs> no, but, but I like, so I think that, you know, we've been accused by mainly by, critics in the the like leftist side of the sphere of of being alt alt idw or like idw light uh and i you know i tend to think that uh very bad wizards and like blocked and reported and and some other podcasts like they actually operate more in oh has my sorry my connection crapped out for a second there i'm back but but okay. like that yeah, that in there are aspects of like what the people in heterodox or sense making spheres are complaining about, right? With like woke overreach or so on, that I I think has legitimacy to yeah. some of the complaints, and I, I don't have any problem saying that. But I I but it's it's so it kind of annoys me that it's taken if you want to like criticize anything to do with wokeism or that kind of thing that you're immediately associated that like the intellectual dark web is where you should go and it, yeah it, for me it's like no just because somebody is complaining about like cultural appropriation of white people cooking noodles it yeah. doesn't mean i want to sign up for jordan peterson's 12 right. uh, month course on the bible like the, yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely i mean i think that there's <laughs> There is so much uh, irrationality. There's enough irrationality to go around. And yeah, depending on who the last person it is, um, I've criticized or we've criticized on our podcast. It's, that's, you know, that's who you might get lumped in with that month. And, and I think that that a lot of people, for instance, when when the Black Lives Matter started happening, a lot of people. I, I think that their feeling was something like betrayal that I was actually so liberal in my views about race, but it's something that, that to me has been like, just, you know, it's obviously been a part of the way that I see the world ever since, you know, I was in high school, let alone since I started the podcast. It's just that we don't talk that much about it, but in the absence of talking about it, people will impute all sorts of beliefs onto mm -hmm. you. And this is why this is one of the reasons that I like you guys so much is um, I tell us more. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully you'll edit this out so I don't look like a simp. Um, that uh, that you guys and I think I uh, I, I think I uh, Chris te texted or tweeted this or DM'd you this that you guys are just reasonable seeming, and that's it's a weird thing to make into such a big compliment, but nowadays it sort of is a big compliment that it seems as if you are moved by actual reasons. And this means that you won't ally yourself with somebody just because you will criticize them. And I've seen you say both, for instance, of Sam Harris, say good things and bad things about the things that he says, and that that would be a breath of fresh air in, in in a little landscape of podcasting in our little corner of the internet is sad it's yeah you know it's sad that you can't predict before an episode is recorded what somebody's going to say about a particular yeah. person it's interesting isn't it like that's no 
that's no great thing, is it, to be moved by reasons? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, yet yeah, it shouldn't be a big thing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, look, look my my co-host is often not moved by reasons either but i have to put him in check <laughs> and it, it, forces. <laughs> <laughs> um and and again it's not as if i think of, of myself as as better than these people i think i just don't have that much stake in in espousing the particular views like there's not that it doesn't matter that much if i say i don't like this particular viewpoint um in a way because i haven't and a huge credit to our audience for i think over the years either either learning from us or being drawn to us because they were already like this that it's okay to uh disagree with each other mm. uh, criticize and still actually like each other you know i, I yeah. think that's one of the things that tamler and i that might have drawn people to to our podcast where we we can yell at each other and be angry and disagree but it does it says nothing about the respect we have for each other yeah yeah but i in really these circles yeah i'm sorry yeah. yeah yeah it's all bound up in the personal and the emotional yeah. and egos and things like that and it's yeah it's, it's odd um yeah i just wanted to echo that like it's something i've said a lot which is that I think dispassion is really underrated these days. Um, like yeah. you know, it's a, it's an old fashioned academic virtue to be have a dispassionate interest right. in a topic, um, and for it to be yeah, you know, just sort of intellectual and and at a at a distance from from your self image and all of those things. And it's kind of not a cool thing to say, but I like I I see it as a a real benefit to um, you know when I think about my non online research. The fact that you do do treat it as a as a puzzle to be solved, in, yeah, um, and, and not something that's connected to your deeply held values and how the world ought to be and so on, that's a plus. Um, yeah, so it's, it's I, so it does. Yeah, it's no great feat. But, you, mm. I think part of the issue with that, though, Matt, is like that's so often invoked now that like people say, you know. Look, I I don't care about the. I'm not emotionally invested in this, or I'm just rationally uh, looking at things from an objective point of view, you know, dispassionately. And it's so often not the case when it's invoked that like there's yeah. a legitimate thing, like you know, the same with sense making or whatever. There's nothing wrong with like the term sense making, right? There's nothing yeah. wrong with dispassionate analysis. But when you when I hear that, when I hear somebody say. I, I don't have any tribe or I, I, I don't, you know, look, belong to any political tribe. I immediately think you're the most extreme partisan who just doesn't <laughs> recognize it. So like, yeah, but, I mean, but it, there are non-partisans, like they do exist. So, yeah. I mean, look at the, the word rationalism already indicates mm. probably yeah. where you fall on. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. It's, it's 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 sad and i think a lot of this is just wrapped up in the incentives that w that are around us right so it's like we can see ourselves sometimes being drawn to saying certain things and podcasting about certain topics because those get us the most tweets it gets us the most retweets gets us the most new whatever patreon subscribers um and that's just we've always you know sometimes to the point where if we've done some episode where uh we made some political statement we're just like next time let's talk about a movie because we would just want to <laughs> yeah. like cool people down a little bit and and just be, it'd be like it's not about that's not what we're it's not the kind of audience we want to cultivate i'm you know? I'm just saying ghosts if you guys <laughs> went by ghosts that seems to like that's all people care about. It doesn't matter who your guest is or what your culture war take. Like, if you want your attention to be swamped, just get Tamler to talk more about the evidence for ghosts. It's funny that you say that. The, the next episode movie, the next movie episode will be Scooby Doo. You know, the documentary. Oh. Well, <laughs> the documentary. Yeah. Just, <laughs> yeah. And you can tell Tamler that the the moral of that story is that it's never a ghost. It's, it's never always an old ghost. man. He never he never wa he never watched it until he the must end. hear those. Like, it just, yeah. like, are you sure yeah. that guy wasn't a ghost? Wasn't that? <laughs> <laughs> Double beer guy, like, yeah, like, I think well, there was so, a deeper commentary about skeptics. And, 
<laughs> while while we're uh, lightly mocking my co-host, um, <laughs> that's, I'll say another thing, which is that um, I think the the relationship that I have with my co-host and the mutual respect that we have is what allows us to disagree. And so, you know, we're constantly mocking each other. Um, but that's also something that's missing in some of this discourse, where it's like, you know, even though people allude to this all the time where, uh, you know, the very topic of this conversation, you will see this, uh, of this episode, we'll see uh, Eric tweeting like, oh, why can't, uh, I'm sorry, Brett tweeting, why can't Eric and Sam just get in a room together and hash this out? Well, because that's never what they were going to do. Mm -hmm. They were never friends like that. It was never that the, whatever mutual respect or the stroking of each other's egos or the sucking of each other's dicks that goes on in some of these circles, it's not really about mutual respect. It's about like whether or not you will get your followers to agree with me and we can like get everybody mad and, and show the other people who disagree with us that they're wrong as evidenced by the fact that the minute a disagreement arises, uh, things go to shit in, within th that space. Yeah, that, that's, it's interesting you talk about, you know, that having a, a wellspring of respect for your co-host, you know, it allows you to have arguments because, like, I just don't have that with Mark. Uh, it's obvious. It's obvious. <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised you guys. We, we, we <laughs> offer it from mutual, uh, like, disdain. <laughs> for each other and, and 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 the lack of respect, but but well, the the problem. This is where I went wrong. Like when I tell Chris too much, he knows too much. So he knows, for instance, <laughs> that I'm like hungover and eating a cookie in the shower. Like it's hard <laughs> to have respect for someone. <laughs> <It's That's> so <laughs> <laughs> this is true. We do share too much about our personal life to each other in uh, incidental conversations about, <laughs> about recording a podcast. But yeah, but like, I, I mean, it, this feels like it, it feels so mundane to simply say that like being able to disagree with someone and not like lose your shit and, and cut all contact, right? When you receive criticism, it's that like, this isn't unusual. And especially in the academic sphere, Right. And, you know, academics can be thin skinned. They can be super invested in their theories. Like I, I, I the, anybody who thinks academics are these objective paragons of uh, rationality, they, they haven't in, interacted with many academics. <laughs> but the thing that academics can do is really harshly criticize each other and their ideas and then be on relatively good terms, like at the next conference. People devote book level critiques and then, you know, they might hate each other, like, but they, they kind of are forced together. And like, we interviewed Evan Thompson, the, the like scholar of Buddhism. And he, he recommended at the end of it, a, like, I think a 10 piece special issue of a philosophy journal that was dedicated to his book. And you know, the way those book symposiums are that they're often very critical pieces. And he, you know, it, like, I just cannot see the Weinsteins or most of the people in the intellectual dark web being able to handle that fairly mild critique where people take yeah. your work, search for critical stuff. And at the end of it, you come back and say, you know, I really appreciate the critical engagement with the content, but here's why you're wrong. Right. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's just it's it's like a weird thing that that's in any way virtuous because it's so normal <laughs> yeah yeah and i don't know you know I, I like i i don't think that this is specific to the intellectual dark web but these happen to be the people that are on our twitter feeds and who are interested in in uh the topics that they that they discuss i'm sure there are i'm sure if you went to like whatever any industry that you have like a, a collection of people who are, who are thin skinned but it just what bugs me is that they can be people who's very, very outwardly proclaimed to be not that. At least you know that like some Hollywood exec or some actor who's like a diva, if they tell you you're never going to work in this town again, it's, you were never under any guise that what they really were seeking was the truth of, <laughs> you knew, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's an industry, you know, that, that, but but when uh, when people purport to be dispassionate truth seekers and treat their followers like a cult leader would treat their, their cult followers, it seems you know, yeah, mm. it's odd. Well, well, on so on on that note, 
Um, steering this back to um, Eric and Brett, and I think I think your episode one ninety one. I'm going to refresh your memory about it because I think it's a good starting point for this. Okay, good. Um, because yeah, as, as you guys mentioned, you know, like us, you're you guys are in principle are, are fans of like heterodox takes and free speech and, and yeah. all that stuff. Um, but what you noticed at the time of the BLM protests, um, and this was before I was really tuned into these guys. Um, Chris probably was more so. Um, I might have you, listened to a couple of things. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, here's some of the th- tweets you mentioned of Brett's and Eric's, um, where Brett called the BLM protests, um, described them as threatening every value and principle that binds us together <laughs> and, the, and the American Revolution. Um, Eric Weinstein said that the crime of driving while black has become the crime of thinking while white. And and Brett and the thing that really annoyed you guys was was Brett Weinstein like drawing this strong parallel like this is the thing we've noticed too where everything gets related back to them and their personal oh, kind of yeah. history and they related these national protests to the local drama that happened at Evergreen and his personal <laughs> yeah uh, right. grievance though and and here's the thing the the points that <laughs> you guys made which is that. Does the IDW have to be such fucking drama queens? Do they have to be doing so much catastrophization, these hyperbolic comparisons and these personal narratives of grievance of being persecuted and suppressed? And also just this underlying current of narcissism um, running through everything. And I'm like, holy shit, these guys have, have got half the garometer going on there. What's the, <laughs> did, did, did we steal this and then forgot that we stole it? I mean, what happened? I, I could never accuse you of, of that given how, uh, how I think clear it is to anybody who's not that invested <laughs> in, in these teams uh, are. But it's an amazing, uh, you know, I'm not a fan of attributing mental illnesses to people I don't know just as a psychologist it's like I'm a non-clinical psychologist I can't even diagnose somebody who might obviously have but but there is something that is very labile um, about um, the responses and is as you say catastrophizing so like if well, let's just point to the behavior the behavior is uh bringing it or i mean it's like evergreen was like his personal 911 you know this is like the roots of this is his 1619 is when he got <laughs> kicked out of evergreen or not even kicked out i don't know i actually don't know what happened <laughs> exactly um um but it's uh it's a disgusting amount of self involvement of the sort that i think a healthy mind ought not have and by definition does not have i just yeah this will be jumping up forward and like we so we should move on to the real of like the narrative of what they've been doing but i i just want to mention like that this is that in a recent uh interview dave or eric did with david fuller this host of rebel wisdom which we'll get to that channel but he he mentioned that you may wonder why in his videos he wears a suit. I'm sure that's something you were concerned about. <laughs> like you've often been curious, why is he so well presented in videos? And he explains the mystery of that to David, that it's not because he likes suits, it's fucking hot and he's uncomfortable in the in the suit. So he's he's taking on that burden because he wants to signal to the ruling class that he's ready to step in at the elite level of institutions and write the ship. So that's why he, he's wearing the suit to, to show that he's ready to join, you know, when oh they invite God. him up, he, he can step in there. And like, the thing is that wasn't a joke, right? Like that was that you might, I'm sure in this, in this video, you've been wondering since you can see me, they have like, why is Chris wearing a, Sure. And yeah. the reason is because, you know, if the COVID <laughs> pandemic, if people need to see that they can <laughs> they can bring me up to the panels so that, you know, I can let them know how to resolve this shit. So I, ne- I need to be wearing a, I can't be wearing a Marvel t-shirt. Like people won't take me seriously. 
I mean, what he's just said is that that I take myself too seriously. Like he has said of himself, that the, the way the reason I wear my uh, a suit is, I mean, look, I'm wearing a Marvel Comics T-shirt, so clearly I'm not going to be able to like <laughs> pop into the ruling class and say shit. Um, but, but that's that, you, that's hilarious. You're actually, but in actual effect, you know, usually in the movies, the Hollywood <laughs> movies, it's the guy in the ironic marvel shirt who is the one with the crazy <laughs> idea like what we should do is test the ducks and we can get the serum and the, like he's, don't, don't listen to him no he's a brilliant genius genius look at his shirt like nobody right. Right. nobody right. would wear that without some deep wellspring of uh insight so yeah uh, I, i've learned i've learned something new today which is that some people when they wear clothes they have reasons yeah, it's, you obviously haven't paid enough attention to Jeffrey Miller and Gad Sad. It's all about signaling when you're ready to fuck and like, yeah, your your fertility period. You, you need to let people know when your testosterone spikes with uh, your t-shirt choices. So, oh god! Um, all right, Matt. So yeah, like the, as Matt said at the start, you're being treated as. A relatively normal person. Okay, good. This this, this might be an uh, like a, a fiction that we've I created, like, but yeah. in, like in comparison to me and the level of Weinstein knowledge, that's probably fair. Matt's somewhere in the middle. He's pretty. He, he's devoted several podcasts to the Weinstein, so he cannot <laughs> claim to be I, like I'm not I do, invested. I, I do blame you guys for a lot of what I know about them because uh, because I follow you on Twitter. And sometimes I just, as I was saying off air, I can't help myself. I'll click through uh, because you'll say, can you believe that they said this? And then I'll be like, no. And so I'll click. Oh. <laughs> and I, was, I was doing this yesterday. In fact, I was, I was on a long flight. I got delayed. I was on a layover, uh, had Wi-Fi. And I'm reading my Twitter timeline and I was like, I guess what I'm going to be doing is watching large chunks of the Dark Horse podcast. <laughs> <sighs> uh. <laughs> I, I, I can remember when my, I gave my as an assignment a four hour conversation between Douglas Murray and Eric Weinstein. And I think. That's possibly the closest Matt's came to resigning from the <laughs> podcast. And there, there was a point in R3 of that conversation where, like, I think both of us were questioning our life choices. So, yeah, there's, uh, uh, the, yeah. We, we shouldn't meta analyze this too much, <laughs> yeah, Matt. So it's, it's dangerous. Yeah, but, it's a bit verging on self harm sometimes. So, um, <laughs> so. Okay, so Chris, you're gonna you're gonna take us through a little bit of what's happened since yeah. since me, the I, what's our jumping off point here? After that brief introduction, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll look. I'm gonna do this in succinct fashion, Matt. It's gonna be I'll be the master of ceremonies and take you through Weinstein world from where we left them. And let me remind you that like so, we've got two brothers we're dealing with here and a wife. Uh, to Brett Heller Hain, who is an entity in their own right, although Matt sometimes suggests otherwise, but um, because he's a raging misogynist. It's misogynist. So, yeah, yeah you know, it's, we, you've seen it David, off the air. It's, I mean, it's I can tell. To... I could just tell. <laughs> yeah. But... <laughs> so, I mean, he's Australian. So, the, the, though, where we left him was like that Brett was firmly on the ivermectin anti-vax train but they they you know they're doing the usual thing of uh, framing it as that they're just asking questions they're they're worried about institutional capture and so on and eric has in the meantime remained like relatively aloof from the conversation he had responded a couple of times just to say that thank you for asking i'm i don't have an opinion uncharacteristically on right. ivermectin um but a lot of that changed oh and also eric's podcast has been on an extended hiatus he's in in typical eric fashion he's given several conflicting reasons hinting at dark forces that were <laughs> conspiring to prevent the podcast but the eric's contribution is mostly around detailing 
what those dark forces um, consist of and what he's going to do about them. Um, so mm. the, maybe yeah. Eric is the easiest brother to deal with. Yeah, look, in, in some ways, Eric's gone the sort of high road in terms of this sort of abstract, nebulous, conspiratorial stuff, whereas... But Brett's gotten, since since we first covered him, um, he's gotten really specific. He's intangible. He's He's gone all in on the anti-vax stuff. So where things began to unwind is since taking that very hard stance, um, they were pushing ivermectin, making pretty strong claims around vaccines being unsafe, having some very strange people um, some very strange guests on talking about the vaccines doing causing like terrible babies brains to explode babies brains <laughs> exploding that kind of thing um and and meanwhile all of the studies around ivermectin which which was at the time quite an ambiguous thing um all the subsequent ev- um, evidence seemed to be pointing in the wrong direction for ivermectin yeah Um, i would maybe clarify that like ivermectin had like like many many potential treatments it had low quality studies some of which were positive and which warranted like further study but it it wasn't the case that like there was a strong body of evidence suggesting that you know it's a very promising thing it was like like many things in the pandemic, it just was simply something that people were starting to look into. And like there had been positive results in uh, in vitro studies, which again, I feel like I'm, I'm not a clinical drug developer or anything, like just somebody with an interest in, you know, science and skepticism. And I understand the pyramid of clinical evidence, which is like, in vitro studies where you see this amazing effect in cells in test tubes is is often th- like not translatable into humans or animals so like uh, there's so many effects which have it's kind of like battery technology right people find these initial great effects but they can't actually turn it into anything that would be usable so they the level of skepticism I think was flipped on this, that the, there was a bigger sign being, you know, in the same way hydroxychloroquine got. So that, that's all my, I, I just, mm. I, I know you weren't suggesting it was strong evidence base, but uh, mm. I don't think any of the attention that was getting was warranted. So, so Dave, uh, let me ask you this. Did, have you heard of the better skeptics project? Um, you know, <laughs> In passing, because I, I again from you guys' tweets, um, I I started going down that rabbit hole, and I couldn't for the life of me figure out what happened. And whatever that day was, I didn't have the time or emotional energy to dig too deeply into it. Um, from what I understood, it looked like some attempt at at um, you know, like. Uh, good faith uh, antagonistic sort of uh, uh, you know dispassionate presentation of evidence but I don't know was it started f- for this ivermectin stuff well I don't want to put you off it but it, it is described by the um, people who run it as an exercise in guerrilla sense making <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> but Chris oh my God. Uh, <laughs> Tell yeah, so the, there's a character like so, Matt. You've you've drawn us onto the like better skeptics wormhole. So we, we'll we'll leave Eric in the dust for now <laughs> uh, because he's not really involved in this. But so better skeptics is a project organized by a guy called Alexandros Marinos. I believe his name is. This person could be described as Brett's uber fan, like. <laughs> Uh, you know, I'm not a man averse to long Twitter threads, but I have never seen Twitter threads the length that he produced to defend almost every claim that that Brett made. And it's not just in the... Like Sam Harris released a podcast with Eric Topo, which was quite explicitly targeted at Brett, right? And this is part of the... Uh, emergence of people within the heterodox IDW space that began to be quite critical 
of Brett, right? Claire Lehman, Sam Harris, Yuri Dagan, who's a character that will come up in this Better Skeptics project. But so it wasn't people just like, you know, us who have been long term critics of the Weinsteins or that. It's people who would be seen as ideologically on their side. So Alexandros took, like, made an Uber thread, which essentially, you know, line by line attempted to dissect Sam Harris's podcast and essentially declare it all, all bad faith, all wrong, no valid points made in any of the contentions. And this is the guy who was organizing the Better Skeptics Project. Now, he was organizing it with his wife, who I think is a journalist, and they put up $10,000 of their own money um, to, to act as an incentive to get people to participate. And you, off air, uh, Tamla, you mentioned, you know, Sam Harris issuing Look, you some. You call me Tamler. This is your one more It's the second time. And, uh, uh, I feel He's done like it to me. Some... He's done it to me if it makes you feel any better, Dave. Have I called you Tamler? No, you've called me Matthew Smith because oh, right. Smith yeah, is yeah. a very boring last name, like Brown. <laughs> you son of. It's the, it's the ghosts in this here building. But, uh, um, so, uh, yeah, the. That project, uh, like you mentioned in off air, that Sam Harris had put up some cash, right, for if people could convince him he was wrong with him right. being the judge. It's, right. it's it's sort of similar in that vein. And the more famous thing is probably like the Randy, uh, like yeah, million dollar challenge, Randy, right? Yeah, right. But um, I feel so, that. So it was sorry. It was it was a project where it was going to be targeted specifically at this Iver, the evidence for ivermectin. Yeah, That's so right. specifically okay. three podcasts that Brett uh, produced, including the mental one with uh-huh. the like two guests called like uh, Three Steps to Save the World, which okay. has the uh, like unhinged entrepreneur Steve Kirsch talking about like babies' brains exploding and, and whatnot. <laughs> I, and, did not, I didn't see that one. <laughs> Pierre, was it Pierre Corey? <laughs> was Pierre Corey uh, the other one? Pierre Corey with Rogan, I think, was one. And uh, the Robert Malone was the, the person who claims to have invented the mRNA vaccine, but that nobody else agrees that he invented <laughs> that. So, like, there's a the, the, this colorful cast of, like, you know, the fringe pseudoscience or, like, people with obscure claims are... Al- Alexandros decided that, like, these three podcasts, that if... Anybody could find any factual errors in that podcast that this project would be designed to show that that and he he framed it um, as basically like he believes in Brett, but he's he wants to incentivize people to really dig into the claims and you know try and take it apart. And he's gonna get independent judges to score the claims and the whole thing will be, you know, and like Matt says, an effort in guerrilla sense making um and they were interviewed by there's this uh youtube channel called rebel wisdom hosted by an ex-journalist david fuller who which started out as kind of a podcast as uh, spinning off pro jordan peterson content like uh yeah. made a documentary about jordan peterson and and then went into other figures offering rebel wisdom right so brett has featured there and various other figures from the alternative sense-making ecosystem. Um, so, so this project was heralded on this uh, Rebel Wisdom channel as okay. Let's get down to the nitty-gritty and and start like enough of the like interpersonal drama. Let's just get down to the brass tacks and uh, assess the details of the claims and. And we are incentivizing people. So, like on the the basic steps of it, it it sounds like not a terrible idea, right? It's, it's like, almost like setting up a scientific community and having them review things uh, by oh, their uh, peers. Uh, I, I wish I had <laughs> prepared this clip. Um, I, I will insert it here, but they there is a clip of one of the judges for this project basically saying that that their goal is to do better uh like better review of the evidence than all of the relevant experts like all of the medical authorities all of the uh you know the the scientific communities 
they they want to do it better because those guys have been doing a bad job of it thus yeah. far. It's like people who want to do away with taxes, but then pool their money to help each other build roads. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so you'll you'll be shocked to learn that this project did not go exactly as plan so i have um, no idea what the, i'm ex- i'm kind of excited now because i have no idea is it over it's over okay it's finished okay. it's issued its final report uh, now now let's see and given that you're a naive person yeah. here right and all you know is that the ceo <laughs> of the project is an uber brat fan so right. With no other information and no details about the judges, just at a guess, Tamla, what do you think the outcome of this project will have been? Um, my hope is that that uh, the final report, um, while overwhelmingly favoring the evidence for ivermectin, at least found one or two uh, potential problems on one reading of the evidence uh, so that they could preserve their air of skepticism and rationality oh my god you, <laughs> how did you guess <laughs> if this isn't evidence of psychic uh, perception i i don't know what it is like that, that was spooky <laughs> yeah so they got i think three or four that they validated out of 40 something submitted uh Objections, you know, the objections, and but Brett and Heller in their recent episode take this as you know, look, this project was designed to take us down, it was an adversarial uh, attempt. Like, and we actually we thought this was the bad way to do it, you know, because you can take individual statements out of context and so on, and yet it passes us with a clear bill of health, so you know. (laughs) What what does it matter what all these you know supposed experts say when this BS project that's the initials yeah, they chose for themselves <laughs> uh, give them a clean bill of health um, and these and sorry the people who were submitting um, their objections were then getting judged by whom I agree well so, I think. First, first, it's important. To, it's interesting who was submitting because there was very little engagement from virtually right. anybody, except it's it's almost like people didn't regard it as a good faith project. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, like... right. But but there was a big fly in the ointment, and that in the form of <laughs> Yuri Gagin, right, Chris? Yes. So, are you familiar with Yuri Dagan? Dagan. Sorry, Dagan. Is his name. It's it's only the name that I saw amongst all the Twitter like threads about this project. Oh, that I think you'll yeah. you'll love him because <laughs> Yuri Dagan. Like I I strongly he's he's one. First of all, he's one of the strongest advocates for the lab leak hypothesis, right? Okay. Which I I have various reasons to be uh, critical and skeptical of um, the claims made therein. But Brett had him on his podcast as a like one of the valued resources, and I think he called him like the the like a star, you know, the best available high quality evidence for parsing the research on like the genetic stuff to do with why lab leak is likely and and, and other evidence. So Brett pumped him up as a very very competent, reliable. Uh, sense maker okay if you will and yuri dagan's background is that he's a russian entrepreneur focusing on life extension technology um like cryogenics and that kind of thing um and he also is a fairly combative twitter presence um it's fair to say so the interesting thing was like uh, he came out strongly in support of the vaccines and drew the ire of the lab leak community, mm-hmm. large portions of it, because strangely, it's almost as if the lab leak community has attracted a, a like a fair share of conspiratorially minded people. It's it's weird. There's like a unexpected overlap there between uh, anti-vax sentiment and lab leak hypothesis advocates. So. Yes. Uh, what, what a strange corner of the world where where 
the the thing that lumps truths together are simply their conspiratorial nature. It's just so odd to me that like that that the that you know these are two completely independent things, like the truth uh, or falsehood <laughs> or falsity of the lab leak hypothesis and and the effect. Of, you know, there is nothing wrong with a world in which one of these is true and the other one is false. Yep. It's just solely a desire to see the world in terms of the, the rebels and the, the gorillas and the outsiders who know the truth and the insiders who are part of the system. And it's like for people, you guys probably, I think, have touched on this, if, if I recall correctly, but for people who have worked in a system like a university system or, you know, a professional society or, you know, a loose collection of people studying the same thing it's just impossible to think that these things work out so cleanly in the way that they think that I couldn't get a conspiracy going. I'm not saying that there aren't that, you know, the CIA has done plenty of shit, but this is one of the organizations with like the most resources in the world. And still that shit comes out. Um, and to think that any, I don't know. I don't know. I, like yeah. it's just odd. Yeah. It's it's hard to overstate how much that's encoded in the DNA, like of all the gurus that we look at, and you know, but like it's almost always maxed out on our scale, right? Conspiratorial. And thinking. it's just in the case of Brett and Eric, I can't help but think it's just this desire to feel important and special and to have known something. It's a uh, this again I'm breaking my own rules but it's like their mom told them they were smart and they have spent their life not feeling as smart as everybody else and now they finally have a host of followers who are telling them no they are smart they're fighting for all of the things that are true and the whole world is against them and you know what on any given sunday like nobody would give a fuck about what they think and mm. they just got launched into this national stage international stage of uh, of uh, people telling them they must be right about something so anything that comes out of their mouth it's people so to their shock and dismay somebody comes on and says i believe in lab leak but i don't believe in ivermectin mm. what yeah. <laughs> I, thought, yeah I thought you were a rebel i thought you were a gorilla you know mm. not to yeah. you know, get into whether or not these like any of these people are the scientists of the sort that you would trust to evaluate. This is why yeah. I like this. So your podcast to me is fundamentally about epistemology and there's a yep. crisis of epistemology. And we, uh, we're so attracted to people who tell us what to believe. All, I think all of us, I think fundamentally. And um, there are people filling the vo that need right now who, uh, who should mm. not be, who should not look. Be. There's a, there's a feedback loop that I think makes, any of the, you know, speculate, even if you want to regard it as like you shouldn't speculate about those things, Brett and Eric have specifically personally stated that they get what they described as a perverse pleasure from feeling that they believe something that the majority think is wrong and feeling that they're so ahead of the curve that other people can't even see it on the horizon. And you yeah. imagine that when you have that personality characteristic and like to go deep in that Weinstein lore, they've discussed like having a, uh, like a, an uncle who basically give them an unconventional education, encouraging them to, to like seek out that kind of thought process. And, uh, when you have that characteristic and then you have the, you know, the modern social media ecosystem where yeah. there, there's this like, just a desire for people who are just going to constantly shit on establishment or the orthodoxy or mainstream thinking. It's, it's like this horrific feedback mechanism where even if you had reasonable points, you're going to get caught up in the churn of bullshit and just yeah. driven further and further. And in Brett's case, the Dark Horse podcast, I remember when they were hesitant to voice anti, you know, anti-vaccine sentiment. Then they have on Geert van den Bosch, who is a fringe theorist, but is like talking about, you know, natural immunity being better than vaccines. And it's still, there's still like a hesitation and a lot of throat clearing. And then it gets to the point where you have like, uh, 
non-credentialed entrepreneur talking about babies' brains exploding. Someone else claiming they really, invented the Do you the really button. say babies' brains exploding? We're, we're paraphrasing. But, um, yeah. <laughs> he was describing no, no, it. He... he was describing it calling, um, causing uh, babies to be born with their brains splattered all Split over the place. Split in half. Split in okay, half. That's okay, right. Okay. That was the phrase. Yeah. It was. So you mean, <laughs> we... you mean into two hemispheres? Yeah, it's never been heard, been heard of before. But, but like claiming that with no irony that you know there's it's the, the what do they call it? the crime of the century, right? And the three steps to save the world. So there's obviously been an escalation in rhetoric yeah. just in the past twelve yeah. months, and uh, yeah, that and well, now there, there's like a walking down of it. But uh, we'll get to that. So. <laughs> Uh, yeah. I mean, but but just to pick up on your point, David, I really agree with you. I think like we're not philosophers, but somehow, actually, you're you're right that it really is all about epistemology. And the the interesting thing about these movements and these characters is is the claim to epistemic authority. And yeah. you can you can think about a lot of these ingredients as whether it's the cultishness or the conspiracy theories or the fact that you cannot trust the establishment. Um, it they all work towards positioning themselves as as a source of of unique, um, trustworthy um, knowledge, and, and and to go to them. So it's yeah, it's it's a, just a yeah. Like I don't think you can understand it without without focusing on that. It's I, um, it's scary because you know we've done quite a bit as a society to try to build up expertise you know, in specific domains and we, you know, d- division of labor, we, we have to, we have to give up the steps in which we might vet every individual person. And we have to trust entire fields to produce knowledge. And I don't know shit about climate change. I just have to trust whatever climate change scientists there are. And the minute that gets eroded, then we're, we're right back where we started, where it's, you know, big chief told me you know yeah. big man in sky mad and it's this is my anthropology by the way that's a yeah i assume that's what every uh, non-white society ever uh how they talk <laughs> this is giving me flashbacks to gatsad recounting his engagement with a postmodernist. Matt, if you remember i don't mm. believe in the sun i believe in walking hyena in the sky right <laughs> this <laughs> yeah. uh, just that but but, uh, but but david's right i mean it's um the scary thing about it all is that it points to how fragile the, yeah the everything how- is and, and as you say it relies on trust and mm. these networks of trust and the trusted institutions and so on and look god knows our institutions aren't perfect sure but it's a bit like it's a bit like you know the the economy is fueled by confidence, and when right. the confidence goes, it it can crash um, quite easily. Um, seems to be you know, a similar knowledge is like Bitcoin. We uh, we are <laughs> yeah. we are completely volatile now in terms of our trust in our institutions. In the same way that my my Bitcoin investments go up and down every single day, and yes. like, <laughs> like that, yeah. like that. That's a point that didn't need an analogy, but I found one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to at this point insert a. Uh, a a quote from a noted philosopher who we we all respect quite deeply, um, who who I think makes is this point very uh, elegantly on the recent podcast. So uh, let's let's hear the our esteemed colleague. And I'm not so sure it is at this point. Again, I think we're in the presence of something like a religious or pseudo religious phenomenon. People are just not thinking clearly, and mere contrarianism is becoming part of their identities. I mean, there's something pornographic about all this. This reflexive distrust of institutional authority is like the pornography of doubt. People are infatuated with this stuff. And there's a, there's a zealotry around it. And the quality of the thinking is so bad in so many cases. <laughs> Given my experience on other topics, it's impossible to shake the feeling of familiarity here 
This is what it's like to argue about religion or the 9-11 truth conspiracy. Well said, Sam. And by the way, just to mention, listening to that, I've, I very rarely hear Sam at times one speed, and it's almost erotic. <laughs> <laughs> he is crazy, as I've always said. Um, I, I listened to, to that whole section on my own, and I emailed Sam and told him how well I thought he put it. And, I, and Sam has a real shot at actually convincing um, that group. Right? Like, I don't, I don't think the people who listen to you or I are the, that group that needs to be convinced. But people who li- there are a lot of people who listen to Sam who I think might actually be affected by what Sam says there. And I love the terms that he used. You know, he's, it's just well put. And it's, 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 it is perverse. It's, you know, it's, uh, I don't know. It's his it's, whole, the podcast he did with Eric Topol was very good as well. Like he's been, he's been good at this. Like I, just before the podcast yeah. came out, I, I think I, I made a tweet saying like what Sam should do in, you know, like me back chair, uh, yeah. uh, uh, armchair criticizing what he should do with his podcast, but he did it, right? He got an expert on and went through the claims and, and so he, he definitely deserves credit for the yeah. like the stance that he's taken on that especially given that he is so sympathetic to the interpersonal aspects like he he is someone who generally doesn't criticize people that he has interpersonal relationships with so the fact that he's willing to in this case means that he he really clearly thinks they're doing something bad look um, if Sa- yeah if sam took the time to chastise me that way I would listen. I mean, I seriously would because I don't think he would spend his time saying the stuff if he didn't think it was truly dangerous. And look, you know, I don't need to, (laughs) I don't need to say all of the things that, that one might have to say about, you know, not agreeing with everything he says, certainly on record disagreeing, but that doesn't (laughs) mean that I can't in this case think that he's just like the voice of reason, man, the voice like, and, and he's, he is this is sam's backhand to to brett's face this is the this is the the slap that i think will be heard across all the idw this <laughs> yeah it's a bit like you know when he released that podcast because like i think it's also directed at eric to a certain yeah. extent these comments and like his podcast re- attempting to resign from the idw where eric responded by saying you can check out anytime you want, but you can never. <laughs> it's, uh, like the um, Eric is is has some corny tweets, man. Oh, been, oh yeah. we gotta get to them. Okay. But I I feel like okay. Look, I was supposed to be master of ceremony, so I'm, I'm going sorry. to return you to the life extension Russian entrepreneur. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah, <laughs> Yuri, and I actually have a clip from him to let you hear him because I think you'll like him. Like this is him talking to that guy. So, uh, yeah, I need to set this up a bit. So, as Matt said, the Better Skeptics project would have, like, just farted into the wind with uh, nobody paying any attention to it, except that Yuri Dagan, this previous person that Brett had held up, uh, essentially decided to really submit a lot of criticisms in detail. Um, And so he, he kind of inundated the project, I think, on the first day with 21 submissions um and they rejected 18 automatically because there was a rule that says you're only allowed to submit three which already i was was gonna say it was the font the font was wrong yeah yeah, well yeah yeah, so (laughs) equivalent to that and like and also the the like twitter account that they had set up was automated to like tweet out that this claim had been rejected. <laughs> I was like, right. So it was just, you know, claim rejected, claim rejected on the first day, which is uh, a wonderful signal. And then uh, they, the the founder went to Twitter and started, you know, taunting Yuri about failing to follow the rules. So Yuri requested that people just copy and paste his, his criticisms if they want free money. And then there was like, 
uh, that being rejected because of duplicate submissions and like the whole thing on the first day was already coming up with the limits of guerrilla sense making right. apparatus. <laughs> and, um, but so Yuri eventually, despite engaging on this project, he he doesn't have faith in this project, right? And he has produced an article for Quillette with Claire Belinsky, um, which is like very, very harshly critical of Brett and, and goes through in depth um because Claire Lehman is also sympathetic to the criticisms, right? Of yeah. Brett. Like and so after he releases that article with with Claire, uh the Claire Belinsky, not Claire Lehman, he then goes on uh David Fuller's Rebel Wisdom podcast for a two hour episode where he takes them through a one hour slideshow <laughs> uh detailing, you know showing the pictures from studies it's kind of like it's a the kind of thing that only me and matt <laughs> might, <laughs> might be interested in but the kind of thing which the heterodox sphere you know this is kind of what they do instead of going to lectures and stuff is uh watch these conversations so it was a really really thorough rebuttal and the, like yuri clearly knows what he's talking about um, when it comes to these kind of studies. And it turns out because part of his expertise is that he has been assessing clinical trials for like the past decade. So he's got oh, okay. a, he, he's actually asked by David Fuller for his credentials at some point. And he's like, you know, why the fuck does it matter? Just believe what I say or don't. But then he teases out of him that he actually has like a decade of experience assessing clinical trials. So he, <laughs> like it might have been relevant, but um Anyway, to clear, I'm going to play a clip of Yuri in that interview um, kind of talking about his criticism of Brett and how he sees it. And it, it's quite a nice encapsulation of his character. And also to call out Brett publicly. Well, why, I mean, Brett is the biggest you... source of this misinformation. He's the biggest voice. Basically, he is the, 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 the leader of the movement for ivermectin false efficacy and vaccine false dangers. Like, Brett is the spokesperson for the movement. So, uh, and he's also a friend, or at least I, I still consider him a friend. Maybe he no longer thinks of me as a friend. And maybe there's a bit of a disconnect between, like, what people in Russia, <laughs> the level of shit they can tell their friends and still remain friends. And, I don't know, people in the United States, that they, they can't, like, there may be so thin-skinned or the, to them like criticism or even vocal criticism or even like being a little bit of a jerk when voicing criticism to them that's a deal breaker and friendship's over i don't know in russia we like we fight first then we drink vodka and then everything's fine <laughs> in russia vodka drinks you yeah. <laughs> I, I, like, I i i really i i can't dislike Yuri, like yeah. you know, he's he's actually uh, almost got encouraged me to appear and debate the lab leak with him. And, and like I've I've made clear I can't debate the technical details, but I I think I can highlight you know the conspiracism and that kind of stuff. But like I I probably will do it just because I enjoy Yuri. <laughs> like, I I'm not. Uh, he seems to have the right attitude about it, but he like, so he does a dissection of the arguments. It's like this in-depth each point showing how, you know, the diagrams that they showed on the dark horse podcast, like for example, saying that the, um, the spike proteins are, are concentrated in the ovaries. And then he shows that like, actually it's a, it's a graph where they cut out the other four organs where the concentration is much higher. And anyway, the paper says the concentration is like, you know, way, way lower than anything that could cause uh, any significant effect. I don't and, know what to call that tactic of taking things out of context, like visually or, or charts, but that's such a classic move, man, you know, cause yeah. like as if, as if the size of the diagram that you show is like, uh, has absolute meaning. <laughs> yeah. There, there was another sign from the diagram in like 
one of the biggest ivermectin studies, the one that I think is now being retracted or like at least has huge questions over it, was that the graphs they used were the default Excel bar charts using the default colors. And they had the the like uh, series one, like the randomly still two. there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like, and, you know, that, that's the kind of thing where people in the alternative ecosystem are like, what the fuck does that matter? You know, it's just a, you don't be nitpicking. And you're like, no, everyone, every academic understands what that implies about the quality of the like thoroughness, which this paper is undergone. And also like that paper is also, see if this raises any weird uh, red flags, Dave, that it's in a journal with one issue. <laughs> so, wait, so there's there's a couple of word insights, right? But uh, this but, but uh, Yuri's Yuri's debunking there is a good illustration of of why that ivermectin stuff is a conspiracy theory because n- none of the claims are hard to debunk. But the thing you notice is that there's so many of them, and it's just like playing whack a mole, where you know one bit of evidence turns out to be rubbish, but they've got a thousand other ones so yeah it's it just has that structural similarity to yep, pretty much exactly. all conspiracy That's, theories yeah it's it's a it's a hydra of bad evidence yeah yeah, it's... yeah. and you know so like they've had uh like the better skeptics project to put a capstone on it like it descends into like farce mainly like internet drama with yuri being called out by various people and judges saying that, you know, they've been uh, like attacked by Yuri online and so on. And then various things coming out that like academics would understand the issue where the three independent judges all see the scores that they submit. And there's various discussions about like how, uh, like there's, I think there's a, they need to get over a barrier of nine to even consider a submission, right? To, to do the sense making, to try and work it out. But there becomes a tacit agreement on the second day that basically you shouldn't be assigning scores of four and five, except in very rare cases, which means that it's almost by default that nothing reaches the level of, of being assessed. And, and then like the things that are assessed are all there's a lot of generosity applied to the claims, right? Like the right. what it's all things where India, maybe there's one academic who said ivermectin is widespread. Therefore, we can take it because one person said it was widespread. So that 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 the person then claimed that India has you know cured or reduced its cases because of ivermectin is not false. You can't say it's false because. Somebody said that ivermectin is, <laughs> is like widespread in India. So the it, like the project falls apart, and it like just as an illustration of the the thought that goes into the project, it's called the BS project, right? Yeah. And the reason for that is that they put like the icon of like the no, right? You know, the kind of red yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Bit for it. But you don't hear that <laughs> in the you audio format you, right you're saying you can't hear a diagram is that what you're saying is that the bold yeah, so, claim that you're making on this podcast so even <laughs> the advocates are referring to it as the bs project in the <laughs> like you know shorthand so and uh, and the judge comes out saying that like they felt informal pressure to lower their scores on the second day and and they, there's, there's just tons of stuff like even the fact that they put baked into the document that they would revise all the rules each day according to you know whatever and there was no criteria for how they would do that they would just like take stock of criticism on the internet and then uh, revise you know so. what this you know what this is chris this is guerrilla bureaucracy this is right this is, this is uh, <laughs> they're reinventing <laughs> p hacking it's like the, 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 you know they could have just read bam's article and, <laughs> and see if themselves the baller but it, it like yuri so Yuri doesn't have any faith in the project. And the guy, David Fuller, the rebel wisdom guy, he hosted them, but he was just like, he was just somebody who thought the project could be useful, right? He's one of the people that is interested in alternative sense making and so on. So he, he highlighted the project and was like, here's an idea. He raised some criticisms of it. And he's actually 
probably the only person in that space that's managed to ask critical questions of like Brett and uh, like various figures, uh, James Lindsay, except for you, um, who 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 then goes on to get all contact cut right from these figures, including Jordan Peterson and stuff. So he, he's, I think he's a good actor, maybe just a little bit too heterodox and kind. Um, and he features Yuri, and then this gets taken as bad faith, right? They didn't wait for the end of the project to pronounce. Yuri went on and he did his slideshow and he took his material, which he'd submitted to the better skeptics. And this is taken as what they are, they've, they've, you know, they're operating in bad faith now. They have undermined the project and they, they're no longer good faith actors. So uh, Brett and Alexandrus regards them as now hostile entities <laughs> in oh, the, man. Is you know this is the kind of thing that they would say. I don't know if they have, but this is what they would say. They would say, you know, I'm not saying uh, that someone got to them, but I'm just saying that this is what it would look like if someone had gotten to them. And it just <laughs> makes me ask the question, you know, did, is, is someone is someone? Th- I'm I'm concerned maybe for their safety because they're they're acting as if somebody has gotten to them. Maybe their family. I don't know. I don't know how somebody would. <laughs> That's you know that is also the thing that then the that Uber fan or very solid people would say like what are you talking about he expressed concern for their safety he's not crit he's yeah. worried about them <laughs> and he right. didn't say somebody had got to them he said it might it's what it would look like if someone got to them like what are you, yeah. you guys this is <laughs> yeah this is reason making mm. in the online infosphere uh but, uh, so but but dave what what do you make of this i mean like putting aside all of those just methodological and issues and bias with a project like this better skeptics thing it seems to me that something like that is fundamentally flawed because it, it what they do is they they pull out they, they get right into the weeds right off the bat they they focus on very particular little claims and you know as we know, one can cherry pick and construct a, a grand narrative and a conspiracy theory from a, a bunch of little details that may in themselves be true. So it, it seems so the, the issue with some with what someone like Brett is doing is um, not those tiny little claims, but rather how they put it all together to create this conclusion that we should be very, very worried about vaccines and essentially pr- encouraging people not to get vaccinated and to use unproven treatments instead. You know, the way that I um, have felt when I hear them talk is is like you would you would think that somebody who had been consult who had consulted with counsel as to what they should say or not say and they they seem like they're often careful to say i'm not anti-vax i'm not i never said vaccines shouldn't be used but um but there is no way you can listen to them for any significant period of time and and think that they're not Hmm. so there it's it's a kind of double speak that they're really really good at actually like where where they avoid any liability or any responsibility for having misled people um and uh by, by denying the you know the letter of like, using the letter of law saying i never said that specifically but you know what you're saying and that's what mm-hmm. bothers me the most like they know what they're saying and this is a question that i came in wanting to ask you guys which is do you think that they believe this shit so I was talking to my girlfriend about Alex Jones, um, and, and she's just she's not the sort of person who <laughs> who listens to any of this stuff. But um, she has fallen into the YouTube, you know, black hole of listening to Alex Jones previous times in her uh, Jones, and you know, and she she's firmly convinced that he's he's such a grifter that he's he just completely doesn't believe anything that he says. These guys are harder. These guys are not Alex Jones. Like I, it sounds like they might have convinced themselves. And I don't, I don't know why they chose ivermectin. I have no idea. But do you think that they actually 
think that they're really being objective at this point? Um, I think they kind of do. Yeah. Uh, if I mean, think, I mean, thinking about Brett and how to say in, on the specific thing. Um, yeah, I, I don't think they're very good thinkers. I think they are conspiracy theorists. And yeah. I, like we, we know how careless they are in terms of their research. Like we know they don't read papers yeah. and stuff and we know they misunderstand things. Um, and I think it's highly connected to that um, narcissism thing. I mean, narcissists really do have that amazing self-confidence so that they they do a cursory glance at something and feel that they've just, fi- you know, without any background, do convince themselves that they've figured it all out. So it's a bit like asking, does, does Trump really believe that he's the smartest man in the world and that, um, you know, all that stuff? And it's kind of the wrong question, isn't it? Like every psychologist knows that, <laughs> yeah. that people, people deceive themselves before they deceive anyone else, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's hard, it's hard to, to, you know, if I were them looking at them, I would say they're just they're doing it for the Patreon, sweet Patreon dollars, but they, they probably don't, don't think that, but I, I think there's too much like they, from being so immersed in their content, but like, it's clear to me that it's, it's a whole mixture, right? In terms of their self image as these rogue intellectuals is, is tied up in their position now with this and it's tied up but their income is now tied into like the you know the increase in patreon support that they've generated from it and the you know just yeah. interest appearances on tucker carlson and so on so it means that you i think trying to disentangle whether the like where the influence is going it's hard because there's influences going in all different directions from them to their audience, yeah. from their audience to them, from their bank to their, you know, they, and, and lots of it is going to be unconscious as well. So I do think, however, though, that Brett has to consciously know that he is not addressing certain arguments. And like, I don't know how he must, if he is seriously deceiving himself that he's answered them, he has like, a level of self-deception armor that any role player would be hugely like envious of. That's like, <laughs> it's, right, it, right. it's, you know, plus 30 to avoid any self-doubt. <laughs> right. Right. Um, by the way, did you guys, I assume since you watch everything, you watched uh, Eric Weinstein unveil his website on Joe Rogan. Oh, that was so painful. Wasn't that, that one, was of the, so one of the cringiest things I've ever seen? I was, it, it really, really made my penis soft. I gotta say, it, it was. It actually <laughs> made me. That's one of the times where I felt sad for Eric. Like I was like, oh, I don't like. I think you're a you know a self-aggrandizing <laughs> asshole. But like, oh god, oh, oh god, like so it's bad. it was worse than the like worst episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm. Or, <laughs> oh. like, and, <laughs> this, yeah, this is, right. This is the this is like when. Trump is like like one of those G eight meetings, and all like the French and the English are all like laughing at him, and he's, he's just but, but like, like you always feel sorry for him, yeah, almost. But like with Trump, he's such a you know he's he doesn't even have the pretense of intellectualism, right? He, he's a buffoon, like who mm. is just so. But like Eric has his shots. water wiggle, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. and he's he's swinging it around, and he's he's built a web website oh, around. Man. Like pull that up, Jimmy, right? To in a weird, a very like bad read of a situation for something that's supposed to be flattering. Such a bad read. I I mean, Joe, I've I don't watch a lot of Joe Rogan. Um, but have you got you guys haven't done a Joe Rogan? You, no, we will. Yeah, no. okay. I was gonna say he's not he's naturally on the list. Um, but I've not seen such uh, animosity toward one of his own guests. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But it, it, and then they get into like I actually agreed with Eric even in this discussion about music, right? And universality. I can't remember what it was about, but it it tinges 
all of the rest of the conversation nearly because Joe is just like kind of like being argumentative and yeah. like dismissive, right? Yeah, uh, super dismissive. I mean, and you know, and because of because he had lost his patience, I think calling him, he's saying, you know, I don't understand anything that you're saying right now, which was yeah, yeah. What you, well, I well. I saw an interview with um, Eric Weinstein and um, Sabine Hofstadter. Did you guys see that one at all? No. Yeah. That that was actually that they were both guests on another program, and there was a bit of a debate between them. And Sabine um, Hofstadter is another um, sort of whatever pu- public kind of educator of physics sort of thing, um, and, and she's quite good and is known for being kind of like a no nonsense kind of physicist. She's she's not into, for instance, things like string theory and stuff where where you can't actually do yeah. collect data and get evidence. And they're they're talking about his grand unified theory, and she's making a lot of very sensible points. And Eric is doing what he usually does, which is to use more complicated language and k- kick it up to a higher level of, of abstraction. Yeah, and like she's a physicist, and she's and she, I just appreciate it because she was flat out saying to his face, "I have no clue what you are talking about." Eric. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's one thing if Joe Rogan doesn't get it or if we don't get it. But um, I found it refreshing. And, you know, this is connected to some of the other little um, dramas we could briefly uh, revisit. Um, whereas, you know, when, when people who really do know their stuff look at these highly technical um, claims to, um, you know, special accomplishment, it, it never seems to stack up. Right. No. I, yeah. It, it's... There is a there is a reason that you know these big paradigm shifts that happen in things like physics, like have have happened from within the academy, like because, <laughs> like I don't know. I mean, it just seems it seems like a reasonable thing to believe that some some fringe person isn't going to upend all of physics. Um, uh, people would be worshiping at his feet. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. uh, this is something though I did notice that you mentioned where he, he, uh, ramps up that level of jargon and abstraction. Uh, maybe yeah. abstraction isn't even the right word because he's just jargony. And I yeah. thought, well, he must not have been a very, I don't know that he was ever a professor, but he can't have be a very good teacher. I mean, is this Brett or Eric? Uh, Eric, I think. Uh, Eric, Eric, yeah. Eric was yeah. never a professor. Yeah, he's he's uh, just you know he's in the private sector where that actually makes you more respected in the room. When yeah. you can say big words that people think are smart, you actually get the consulting gig. But yeah. in in academics or whatever, you know, there Richard Feynman spoke in a way that we would understand. Like, <laughs> yeah, yep. Actually, you know, and it's not it's not even super uncommon. Like, it is relatively rare, but. Um, for instance, at um, at my institution, for a little while, they um, they had a um, like a like a specialist statistician, right? Who was who was hired specifically for for the purpose of you know helping with the stats. And it's a small university where I work, um, and, and I had, didn't have anything to do with it. But people were sending me his stuff because they'd begun to notice that something was wrong because there was no one that he was like the expert. He claimed to be an expert in statistics, um, and I I wasn't around when he was hired. But they found that. Nobody could understand anything that he said. Nobody could understand anything that he wrote. And people with just a tiny bit of statistical um, ability were noticing that some things and the stuff that he submitted just kind of didn't add up. And they asked me to check. And look, it turned out this guy was exactly the same. He was actually a total fraud. Um, He'd been hired out of desperation because it's very hard to hire a statistician (laughs) uh, in in Australia, actually, because they're kind of rare. And um, <laughs> yeah, so these people are around, like people who can sell themselves and get by, uh, as you say, much more common in the private sector than in universities. It is. And I have some experience there and it's hilarious. Like, it's hilarious. It's hilarious, yeah. Uh, to illustrate this, I'm just going to read a recent tweet from Eric, which is uh, discussing his relationship to libertarianism. So <laughs> let, let's see if this illustrates any of the points you make. I view radical libertarianism as almost literally the linear approximation to a free society where you take all non-linear ways we impact each other and send them to zero in the libertarian limit. Conversely, they see my world as perturbation theory, perturbation theory on a completely free society. So 
I don't know what you're talking about. Like me, that's very clear what he's saying, right? He's made like, it more complicated. Yeah. <laughs> no, like... what, what? That's clearer. It's a perfect analogy. He needed to draw those references just to make it clear that like, you know, it, it, it wasn't it wasn't clear until he mentioned perturbation yeah. theory. Let me you, right. Let, yeah. you, you need to add all the nonlinear interactions in or approximate <laughs> them, but you need freedom and its adjustments. <laughs> that this was is, just, I, like, that's from the same thread. <laughs> my my Weinstein translator is I want libertarians to like me and I want to sound smart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, so yeah, the, there's a there's it's often fairly straightforward to see what is involved and getting lost in the jargon is it's like a you know a, a chinese finger trap or whatever i'm sure that's racist you, but you, we were taking yeah it is you were uh <laughs> you were we were t- we were talking uh offline about um our verbal tics and how when we listen to ourselves they annoy us and how we could feel that they are linearly huh huh how's that <laughs> uh linearly related to the degree uh, of our sort of lack of confidence in what we're saying but he he they're not verbal ticks for him they're just, just throws out complicated words for people to sound he's smart so like that's the kind of insecurity that is so it you know it's very typical of narcissists where but but he, you should be able to I feel like just a little bit, uh, a little bit of listening to him. Anybody should be able to pick up that he's not, that he's not. Actually, Even when he doesn't have the water smart. we go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's not smart. He's not well, smart, smart. Well, so I just got to say, he didn't have a water wiggle when I was talking to Sabine Hofstadter, but he did have a toilet, uh, like a cardboard toilet roll holder. <laughs> it's good was, to have props. And he Which had, a, was, I think that using like a water wiggle. <laughs> yeah, he was holding it. I think there was a rubber band around it, and he was he was using that. Um, but speaking of insecurity, uh, I could read another tweet from yeah. Eric Weinstein. Boom! Look at the itty bitty balls on little Timmy. That's my <laughs> wife's and my work, which Juan Malvasina used initially knowingly and without citation. As you know, you scum. You just called me a crackpot, and simply to take our work. Look forward to hearing from me. Good day. Parasite. You hashtag, po- you post hashtag modern... Parasite. Hashtag harasser. You, oh, hashtag. You post, oh, my God. Uh, you two postmodern bastards have, like, jumped around from the, the, <laughs> the very careful narrative that I had scoped out. And, Matt, you've now leapt on the Eric but before <laughs> sorry, even finishing sorry, sorry, sorry. The, the, the Better Skeptics Project at, uh, with, with the, the Itty Bitty Balls tweet, <laughs> which which requires context, right? Because who is little Timmy Itty Bitty Balls? <laughs> I'm the Chaos Dragon. Do you know Chris, Dave? Chris, I'm, all, I'm, I'm just noting something that, one, David needs to go to bed at some point, and two, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but we may not have time for the entire saga. Of this is going to be so, a free, yeah. You guys are going to have to devote two more episodes to this. You know that. Yeah. Look, we, would, we will have time if we if we follow the regimented <laughs> plan. But, uh, but look, okay, we'll get rid of Itty Bitty Balls Timmy at this point. So do, do you know who that is? Your guest. Oh. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I listened to that episode with great interest because um, I wanted to know what was going on with gauge theory and if it was going to finally provide us with a unified theory. And um, I, I enjoyed it. And uh, I um, and I, I anybody, anybody can listen to Eric and Tim Nguyen s- speak. And if you don't come away thinking that it's very clear which one of them knows their stuff, then I think that there's something broken in your basic perception of other human beings. <laughs> yeah. Think... Yep. Yeah. And yep. I think, Matt, we can like tie up the Eric Bull in a very simple knot, which is like what he's been doing in the meantime is insinuating that he's going to destroy or potentially l- legally... Uh, yeah, sue his critics who have been preventing him from releasing podcast episodes via some unspecified mechanism. And he's essentially suggested that he has the dirt on all of these figures, many of whom have appeared on our podcast, right? Tim and uh, Dan Gilbert, Bad Stats. So he, he started 
releasing his evidence. And it's fair to say it went like the first one went down just like a lead balloon. He he basically took a comment where Dan Gilbert uh, on a Discord server had made a thing saying, oh, I heard Eric said that he wanted to rape like children. So that's what I'm going to spread across the internet, right? So it's obvious in that framing that that's a joke, right? Like that somebody <laughs> is, is saying, oh, I'm going to interpret this in a malicious way and spread and he and didn't do that but he used this as an illustration of like this is the kind of information i have about my critics and these are the kind of people they are they make well, these horrific child abuse jokes and, well, no uh, no no he describes them as threats against his family yes threats just... against his family yes uh so the, uh, so he that that like you would imagine that you probably lead with your strongest evidence right and he basically said in the coming days you will learn what i've been enduring with and like there's a possibility that eric has to deal with some unhinged fans i don't uh, i imagine that's possible but from my experience with like tim nguyen and dan gilbert like they're just the like they're reasonable people you know too online like all of us but yeah. they're they're not going to be hunting Eric's family down to, to or like you know trying to accost them at the crossroads. So this this notion that this tweet is the you know and we got tagged in by the way. I we saw were, that. I, yeah, I saw tagged that. in as. Uh, is this the kind of guru that you want to protect us from decoding the gurus? What have you got to say for yourselves? So you're you're officially uh, uh, bad guys, TM. Here yeah, <laughs> and this is the first time Eric's ever like directly referenced us. Uh, yeah. So a watershed moment. Um, <laughs> and then in the the days to come, he actually tried his one of his fans and various people saying, "No, what can we do, Eric?" Although it's fair to say most people responded by saying, "What the fuck is this, Eric? This is someone making a joke on the Discord." Like even his fans were like, "This is would like just release the podcast." You, <laughs> but the uh, the next day. Or a couple of days later, somebody released, uh, like he retweeted somebody who said, you know, what can we do, Eric? And Eric's advice was like, uh, I'm paraphrasing, but it was essentially, please get my critics and like deal with them because I don't have the, if these people can't be, you know, addressed, I don't, I don't have the ability to do it. And yes, yes. maybe so he, if he, people on the internet. Yeah, so he he's very concerned about the is it a Streisand effect? Is that the one where he he doesn't <laughs> yeah, want to? Right. Yeah, he does. He coined he, a new term. The oh, Streisand squeeze. Streisand oh, squeeze. squeeze. Yeah. Yeah. There, nice. you go, there you go. There you go. So he's he's mentioned that a lot, and he very much encouraged his fans to go into bat for him, and you know, you know, do your thing, Twitter type stuff. And there was very little response. Yeah, it didn't um, work. <laughs> except oh, and this is beautiful. Steve, I have to tell this you is, this. this is, it was one account. Free Float 55. You've not heard that name before. No. This account just joined Twitter randomly. And it, it was an unusual account because it was mainly interested in the minutia of the Tim Nguyen and Eric Weinstein feud. And it, it had an odd tweeting style saying, in what world is Tim, Eddie, you know, uh, a, a little Timmy, a respected person over Eric Weinstein and so on. And it's the only other account that used the hashtags harasser and uh, parasite, which Eric used. So it's it's a very strange account, but uh, I, I'm I'm not insinuating anything. I'm just asking questions about Free Flow Fifty Five. <laughs> well, uh, you know, you 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 should be deeply afraid of the inevitable litigation that will come your way. Um, That's it's just a hypothesis, dear. This is just a, we don't wait, deal in what's conspiracy the theories. What is that account still up? What's it called? Uh, it disappeared and it came back. And I didn't want to name it because I was enjoying so much. Like, if it's not Eric, I will eat my shoe right. live on camera. Just... Like the nobody else tweets like this. And it like the only account to use the hashtag. Like, how bad do you have to be at making? An alternative. So uh, it's it's called Free Float 
55 and i'm just checking now it's, it's since been deleted and i i can't oh, believe gone. i did i can't believe i didn't screenshot those tweets yeah dave because trust us it I was just 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 in terms of the use of length like eric has a distinctive mode of expression and i i, I like I, I tried to approach it in a very um skeptical way but i I would eat my hat if that wasn't Eric tweeting that. It was referencing minutia about like Weinstein world that I don't even know. So <laughs> it's like it's either an Uber fan that just appeared yeah, or right. it, it's the uh, Eric. So <laughs> can you imagine the embarrassment of being like followers? Get him, and then like nobody. So you have to like nobody. create an alt <laughs> yeah. account. Like. Yeah. It's so oh sketchy. Oh, and it was it was abusive. That like free flow account was like swearing and stuff. So that's why it was I, I like didn't want anybody I mentioned it to people, but didn't want anyone to, you know, call it out because I, <laughs> I just want to observe Eric in his natural habitat. <laughs> like unleash Eric Weinstein. But he <laughs> yeah. He he but even with that, about four or five people that are not me said like aren't you just an eric sock puppet <laughs> so and, and he was like sock puppet what's a sock puppet <laughs> wait, <laughs> wait, yeah. <laughs> wait till he finds out about ip addresses <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, just, just, so okay so that's eric we he's gone we'll get we'll close out the the weinstein uh saga by i've got i've got a couple of clips you guys i like to take weinstein clips and I think you need to hear them. So first of all, since we've been talking about Eric, here's Eric. So he did the podcast on Rebel Wisdom. This Rebel Wisdom channel has a lot to answer for in the recent months with the Weinsteins. Um, and this is Eric talking about, he basically said he didn't agree with Brett and he fought Sam's criticisms. Actually, first step, this is him talking about Sam's criticisms. So listen to how he framed them. Well, I think Sam kept his sword mostly in its sheath. I think that Sam is a... Sam and I both maintain different versions of a principle. I'm more radical than he is. I believe that there is a lot of residual wisdom in a corrupt system. I believe that our institutions are degrading, they are greatly degraded. I cannot stand the leadership class, but I believe that all of those things, like um, all the things that are in place in a hospital to make sure they don't cut off the wrong leg if you're having uh, an amputation or something, these things are part of the wisdom. They, they were put there in part by people who are now dead where nobody remembers why they're there. So. I think Sam has an instinctual feeling that the system works. Now, obviously, there's the personal dimension here, but we shouldn't get distracted by the... Oh, sorry. That, the, the, that weird music wasn't in your head, by the way. That was in the background of the clip. But What? <laughs> yeah, I, I love that because he's essentially saying, like, we are the descendants of, you know, the, the real geniuses who, you know, discovered fire, built the aircrafts, but we are like the monkeys who don't know how to do it. So we're just worshipping the technology. And some of the information of the ancients is still there in the institutions. But it's now run by like corrupt bureaucrats who don't understand how any of the systems actually work. It's Wait, By like the way, you know, uh, those systems like what's in place to prevent you from getting the wrong leg amputated. <laughs> Those are the ones that Sam trusts, but I'm a rebel. Like, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I, I'm pretty. I trust those as well. Like, I'm pretty sure that's just a marker on your leg as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh uh, man! So that that but clip I, was just to load up the okay. better clip. Okay, because this I mean, was, it, it borders on gibberish. It, it does, but it highlights. This is how Eric needs to frame that. Like, yeah. he thinks Sam has a point. Okay. Right, he has to couch it yeah. in all this kind of vague stuff because he can't directly just say Brett is wrong. And this is him talking about like he does express that he disagrees with Brett, but this is how he kind of frames it in that discussion. What's going on with Brett? What's going on with Ivermectin, the Joe Rogan podcast, with all of this stuff is downstream of a total leadership vacuum. I know what to do 
to build leadership. I know what I would do if I were a member of the establishment in terms of sitting in a seat at an institution. We have careerists, we have peacetime careerists where we need wartime generals. And I know what to do as a wartime general. I don't know what to do with peacetime careerists in a war, in a war footing. Now, everything is downstream from that. Like blaming Brett Weinstein. Whoa, 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 whoa. You told people not to wear masks because they don't work, or in fact, they retain germs, so you can get sick from your masks, so don't wear masks, but make sure that the health professionals wear I mean, that's such an affront to the mind that, um, and, and you're still sitting in your position. You're still lying to the public. Uh, I don't think we understand that the era of pre-internet public health is permanently over for the rest of our lives. You cannot come up with cute little rhyme schemes or, you know, my personal favorite is there's a tradition of storytelling in public health where you try to get celebrities to do things uh, because they have the, the sort of. Sorry, I, I let that go on too long. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, it got interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so, oh, my God, man. So I, you can't blame Brett, right, because the WHO and stuff said that they didn't recommend mask wearing for the public at the very start of the pandemic. Like, this is something, Dave, that I just, I'm so, this is like a personal a thing that deeply upsets me because like, if you followed the recommendations of the WHO, the CDC, from the beginning of the pandemic, what you would have done is social distance, practice good hygiene after a month into the pandemic, started wearing masks in all occasions. But but you shouldn't have been out in public in crowds anyway, because they were saying, like, avoid those, like, don't do that. Right. So like this notion that if you followed the advice of the experts, you would have been like you basically had a death wish. It's just bullshit. Like the, the, it, even the mask thing, if you take it, it's a it's a short term thing. And it's simply they were already recommending that you don't go out in public or meet in groups. So. Right. And if they were wrong about the masks, then they became right when they said start wearing masks. And now you're still mad at them for lying, like lying, not being wrong, lying. So mm. Why? Why were they lying? Why does he think that them switching a month in to say, no, shit, wear masks? Like, why mm. is why were they lying for that month? It, what was the end game there? And why are you still mad? Why are you still mad now that they? It's look, either you're supposed to wear masks or you're supposed to not. And like, I mean, I, th I think the interesting thing here is the like the subtext or the, or the 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 reason for making such a big deal out about this. It's, it's he's so keen to um, destroy the credibility of public health. And this is just like he made such a big deal over there their finance the thing that they did with inflation what was that called chris oh uh, the boskin commission the boskin commission or whatever this was the smoking gun apparently that completely invalidates all of uh, economic theory and economic management um just like his you know um revelations about physics demolishes physics just like brett's revelations about mouse telomeres destroys the entire pharmaceutical industry and and probably evolution as well so like the point the point to all of this is to try to like his term is fud have you heard of fud yeah fear uncertainty doubt yeah so he he thinks that these nefarious groups are all about sowing fear uncertainty and doubt whereas the truth to is what end yeah, that's what that's what they do. That is their that is their entire thing to to it's, take it, any any little ambiguity and to use a crowbar to turn that into a huge amount of doubt and and fear in order to attempt to um, disparage other sources of um, knowledge and center themselves as being ready in his nice suit to step in and be a wartime general and, and take the reins. 
you know this guy owns a sword. You just know. Yeah. It. You know he has like you know some samurai sword over his mantelpiece. You know. I'm um, I'm wondering why he's not dressed in army fatigues, right? Like the the clothing is supposed to be you know signaling readiness, right? He should be. He should go the whole hog. Wear just wear a general suit with like. Badges and yeah, exactly. like purple hearts and Cap- shit. Captain Crunch, <laughs> just Captain Crunch himself out. Um, but here is the the fucking cowardice that really makes me mad, where it makes me just say like fuck you, um, because he to deflect the very real damage that his brother is doing to to mm. not even in a in an honorable sounding way defend his brother he is like wanting to have his cake and eat it too he wants to still stay in with the cool kids and and yet not blatantly throw his brother under the bus he's playing this line where anybody who wants to continue to believe in brett's ivermectin bullshit can continue to do so because you know eric didn't come out and say he was wrong but clearly sounds like he knows that his brother is wrong and is too much of a coward to call Mm -hmm. him out on it and it Mm -hmm. i would not give three-fifths of a fuck about these brothers if it weren't that so many people are listening to them and this is just causing grief causing suffering and causing death how that that you can't just get up and say you know what get vaccinated I don't care what my brother says about this. He's a smart guy. I love him. I don't care what he says, though. Get vaccinated. Have some fucking balls, man. Mm-hmm. Or ovaries yeah. or whatever it takes. Yeah. <laughs> like that, because, you know, you mentioned, David, about like the actual consequences and the the context around this. And part of the reason that like a lot of the criticism of Brett became more pointed was that there was like this case, right, where there was a British man who had been vocally skeptic about the uh, vaccines and the relative threat of COVID. And he was sharing Brett's content and he basically live streamed almost up to the point where he died. Right. Oh, so it's God. like, it's a tragic event. And of course it's a, you know, it's, it's just an anecdotal e- e- story, but the point is that we can plug in, that, we can plug in the statistics, Chris, can't we? And we can, right. we, we know by the audience reach and so on that we can confidently expect he's, there's more than one anyway, go on. Yeah. It's sorry. just a, it's a dramatic illustration of something which like Yuri and various other people are saying has to be happening behind the scenes. Right. And obviously it is because when people don't take the vaccines and there's a, a deadly virus going around that is killing millions of people in the global pandemic, people die. And, uh, you know, it's kind of, there's like an amusing element to it where Brett's fans are leaving reviews for horse, horse paste on Amazon, right? And it's it's hard not to have a kind of macabre, macabre that's the way you say that, uh, like humorous reaction to it. But it, it also, like, that shit's real. Like people are not getting vaccinated and eating horse paste. And you're like, man, it, it really, all this stuff, all this drama around the IDW and, you know, how hard it is to call people out and stuff like in this situation, like how hard is it just to say like, yeah, what, what you said, you know, you should get vaccinated and, uh, you know, you can still have all your criticism of institutions and so on. But like, this is a deadly pandemic and the evidence shows that these work. So get vaccinated, whatever else you do. Yeah. It, if Eric thinks that Brett is wrong and he's talking like this, then this is just evil. It's just evil. You know, it's, it's shameful. Yeah. But look, it is. I, I, it is. Ma, there's two there's two final clips right so maybe this will like bring us back <laughs> we can come and on a, on a positive note you yeah. these clips are going to really lighten your day so one is you remember the better skeptics project remember that matt mm-hmm. <laughs> that, we were, mm-hmm. that we were trying to finish out well here's brett responding to that project right this is him how he reads what that project found 
I thought this is a dangerous way to do this. It's prone to several different kinds of bias that I don't see um, protected against in it. And I was very concerned uh, about, you know, a process that, um, you know, incentivize instead of people having skin in the game, it incentivized them to go nitpicking and, yeah. um, and all of this. But anyway, in the end, it gave us not a totally clean bill of health, but a remarkably clean bill of health in light of how much um, landscape and how many complaints uh, certain people had made. So given that that process concluded and that that process does say something about the quality of what we've been doing here on Dark Horse, didn't David have some obligation to say, well, you know, here's the process that I suggested might evaluate this and here's the conclusion, which is not what he did. He actually circumvented it. And yeah. um, frankly, I resent it, which David knows because I've said it to him. There you go, David. Totally. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you, you could take all that back, what you said there, because Dave. <laughs> he, yeah, and he, it's, it's almost like he addressed you personally. You're right, I right. I felt and it. And I, I let him know. I felt uh, it. <laughs> At least he didn't call me Tamler. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's. I, I mean, what an amazing, amazing ability to read. Uh, <laughs> to read into something <laughs> the way that you only the way you want to read into it <laughs> imagine it's like you delving into your reddit and finding <laughs> someone you know issuing a defense of you and saying well we we had our criticisms but on our reddit if you look there's somebody who thinks that we are the dog's balls and like really what else matters and, and play, to, to, to like wrap it in that rhetoric you know i was really concerned I, I know that there are biases that creep into the process. And then to use, I believe, the phrase that, that uh, uh, what's his name, Nassim uh, Taleb. 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 Yeah. yeah, his uh, skin in the game, um, <laughs> who just may, reminded me that I think that Taleb actually has shit on Brett quite a bit. Um, yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't surprise me. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, to wrap it all in, into that, oh, oh man, I don't, yeah. I, I don't, I sometimes when I see the dark horse, I think, who isn't hate watching this? Aren't we all here to hate watch <laughs> it? And then I have to remind myself, no, no, no that's the, should, don't don't read the YouTube comments because <laughs> don't man. don't go into the. This is the one thing I truly can say to all listeners and you, Dave, and anyone. <laughs> Don't go into the corner of the internet where Brett's true fans reside. The Dr. Roller Gator War Water is is good God. <laughs> like stay away from that end of the internet. It's a it's a horrifying place. Yeah, I'm just, I mean, I, I, I'm sorry, I just said I, I just I just went on to the IDW uh subreddit and there's a nice little uh list of names of people who belong and uh links to eric and sam and jordan is this one of theirs <laughs> well there's one subreddit like there's lots of subreddits which are not pretty critical like sam harris's subreddit is half hit right. uh, and uh and like you know i think there's usually a healthy if you've got a healthy mix in your subreddit that's good but there's one i think it's just called idw and it's like <laughs> It, it is it is not that it is like pure <laughs> it's the pure distilled essence of the idw in subreddit form mm. and oh, so yeah. if you're looking at that, that that's a yeah that's a beautiful thing mm -hmm. and I, I like so you thought that that clip was bad this is the last clip we're gonna let uh, uh, go to bed very soon God but i think bang. this <laughs> this is a good one to end with because so to to just editorialize this is at the end of the process where you've had Sam Harris release two episodes. You've had Yuri Dagan do a two-hour slideshow presentation with David Fuller. Then David Fuller comes out with a massive long article in Aereo, which is quite sympathetic to Brett, but which essentially says, you know, he's just trying to make sense in this ecosystem. But it, it at the same time says, but he's got trapped in an echo bubble and he's, uh, he's promoting disinformation. And so there's that article. Then there's this huge article in Medium, which David Fuller also releases, going through 
the evidence for each of Brett's claims and kind of uh, collating all of the refutations. And he releases a video series where he's interviewing people, kind of slamming Brett. So these three things come out on the same day. And that, oh, that's part wow. of what Brett is reacting to. So he has that. He has Eric has appeared with the of it as well, right? Essentially doing as much as Eric can do to say negative things. And then Brett and Heller released a podcast, which essentially avoided all mention of the uh, ivermectin vaccine controversy until it got to the Q&A section. And then they addressed it in a few short segments. So this is an extract from that clip um, of why they haven't talked about it and what they're going to do moving forward. I mean, there, there, there is a lot more to say, but basically um, there's been very little careful scientific pushback. Uh, there's been a lot of social post pushback. And what we have said privately to people is this feels very postmodern. It feels very familiar. It feels very much like there's a social universe um, and a set of social conclusions that people insist that we must come to. And um, trying to figure out what is actually true um, should not interface with that social universe, nor does social pressure change what is actually true. And so we have made a conscious decision to not be talking about it as much anymore absent big changes in what we understand to be true. We are not going to play defense. We are not going to respond to uh, critiques that don't have new information in them and the people making them know what, uh, what that means. And um, there's just a lot of evidence that continues to grow that suggests that the position that we have laid out both in what we wrote and what we have said on many previous episodes um, holds. And if that changes, if anything about that reverses, we will absolutely come to, um, to, to you, our listeners. There you have it. I, you know what? Can I just say fuck you guys for, uh, (laughs) <laughs> ruining the rest of my night first of all it's because of you guys that i can even all, just through hearing i can recognize all of their voices just because of your <laughs> tweets uh second tonight i'm just going to be on like r slash idw trying to get into the minds of these people um but uh third her voice is kind of sexy and smoky when she's giving me that misinformation. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll talk to that as well. I, I think like most of these figures have a very like mm. good yeah. authoritative voice but, for yeah. what they're saying. I, I would but, hate to listen to a uh, two channel audio of Heather and Sam Harris, you know, in each ear yeah. to like whispering, but blowing what's, down. <laughs> what's that book that was like a spin off from the Twilight series that became like a, a erotic sensation? The 50 BDSM. Shades of Grey or something? Yeah. Like yeah. Sam and Heller reading. Fifty Sheets of Grey. I feel that that would, you know, that would be, forget the Patreon <laughs> money. That's where the real rubber hits the road. But, well, but David, well, that, go, this is all sounding very postmodern. You're not <laughs> discussing the substance. You're not discussing the scientific. Who cares that Heller has a sexy reading voice? It's, it is insane making. It is being gaslit by uh, somebody I don't care about. It's like when she says that stuff, I'm like, wait. How is it postmodern to disagree with you about like the scientific facts? Like, th- and how could you accuse a sci- scientist of being postmodern when it, like, it is the most post, what she's doing is the most postmodern, postmodern <laughs> yeah. thing that you can imagine. It's like, I literally feel like just uh, uh, anger bubbling up in me at being <laughs> gaslit by the second voiced woman. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I, I should have ended could've... with the Russian. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you should have ended it with the Russian. Then I would have gotten straight to sleep like a baby. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we should tell oh. your listeners that we are in very, very different time zones. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No. I... Yeah, I mean, just to reiterate, we scheduled this at a time that's extraordinarily convenient for me and Chris. And 
well beyond <laughs> Dave's bedtime, and I'm consciously aware of that. So thank you so much, Dave, for staying up late well, despite hey, all the glasses. Yeah. Of wine. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate. I, I appreciate. It. I had a lot of fun. Um, I I hope that we can do something similar again. Um, the the only question is who who can not make me go crazy like the way you. Well, guys the, 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 the second thing I feel like apologizing for is that we not only kept you up very late but we we kept you up late mainly to sit there and listen to <laughs> us ranting about our obsessive pet projects it's uh, well, you know so i don't know next time i'll we'll have to let you no need to apologize I, for that because as you know listening to podcasts is an intimate medium and so uh the if i had the option of just listening to you guys as i was trying to fall asleep uh, but this in this way i get to talk back yeah, yeah. yeah that, that, that's you know i tried to tell matt like matt we don't need to put out another weinstein episode but it's, <laughs> you know it's too much and matt is just always no chris give the people what they want they want to come on i know you you don't like listening to it but i i i care about our patreon so i mean he's he's now trying to editorialize that this is this is he's reluctant to do it but Behind the scenes, I, I'm just his little or you know monkey. He grinds <laughs> around to talk about the Weinstein's, Chris. Say what they said. <laughs> you know what I love is you should if you're not patrons of these guys, then you should be because if you would just get the visual, you would know who's lying and who's telling the truth very, very clearly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> look, Matt, Matt is a seasoned all this research on gurus. He's perfected the facial twerks. He's 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 got like charisma oozing out of his pores. I'm I'm frank, thankfully grateful that <laughs> none of our listeners can be seduced by his, you know, boyish come hello looks because yeah, yeah they, they, the common comment that we actually get when people see videos is like they're just surprised that I don't look like a fucking craggy thousand year old man <laughs> and, uh, and uh, they generally very uh like complimentary about your appearance matt silver fox has been mentioned more than once right mm. well mm. i think yeah. there's one thing we can all agree on is that uh everybody must start listening to you guys because of the sexy accents that has to be what's driving most of your traffic that's well, maybe we should read 50 shades of gray like <laughs> i'll do the female voices matt <laughs> I'm, I'm imagining a, a a new tier for the patreon um, it's <laughs> black black label he, he stepped firmly onto the leather chair and strapped me down <laughs> rigorously <laughs> yeah. well, nobody wants to hear that <laughs> my only question yeah. is how uh Two British, uh, two English accents could be so different. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, okay. Oh, oh, oh. That's, that's, that's problematic. Yeah. That's problematic. That's problematic. Yeah. That's, that, that's just got to go. That's got to be cut. So, uh, <laughs> just for yeah. your patrons. <laughs> yeah. But wait, like I, like Matt said, I have to say, Dave, you. You handled m m me and Matt's obsession and the meandering postmodern route that we took, despite our extensive notes to to try and avoid otherwise. And you also handled about thirty or forty minutes of random banter before we began the thirty-minute <laughs> banter introduction to the podcast. So you, this man, is a <laughs> podcasting. Trooper, because you you also recorded an episode right B prior we, to we starting recorded, this. We only recorded our little support section, which for Tamler and I is eighty three minutes. Um. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's good well, to hear. Yeah. I, I, I'm I'm glad to hear that. But... Well, there's there's almost no need for us to recommend um, to our listeners to check out Very Bad Wizards because I'm pretty sure the the Venn diagram of our audiences is where like a a very small circle embedded within that large circle. But for the three or four people that don't, um, do check it out. Yeah. Wow. And then when you guys start your, like, anti-vaccine descent, we <laughs> will call you out. You guys are going down. That's, we're, right. we're that's, what, that's, what, that's what friends do, Dave. <laughs> yeah, we're going to step into your Patreon gap. And, uh, <laughs> we both know which one of us would be uh, falling into an anti-vaccine trap in it. 
It's gonna be, it's gonna be <laughs> the, guy, the guy who believes in ghosts. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I people keep like insinuating that basically we're like we're you know clout chasing by we want to take down the Weinstein so that we you know can enter the intellectual dark web as the like I don't know like a Sif you kill the them kings, and you the kings you are dead their long, power. long live the kings. Yeah. <laughs> Don't link the gurus. But um but the real mission we have is it's really to take your spot. <laughs> it's yeah. a very bad <laughs> thing. This is and our our Reddit is a fucking like a polyp which oh, that's right. popped off yeah, from really. your subreddit. So <laughs> yeah, that's that's maybe not the nicest way to describe the kind effort of our fans <laughs> to develop a, a subreddit, which is really good, but uh yeah, <laughs> that uh so well, we owe a lot to you. You are your grandfathers in, well, in many respects. Thank you. We are old. You'll be able to take our spot soon. We we're near death. I promise you. But thank you guys so much for having me on. This was a blast. Yeah. <laughs> According to lineage selection, we're all you know working for the same ends anyway. So that's <laughs> at least us white people. Um, <laughs> yeah. All right. Cool. Well, enough bantery exity thing so cheers Steve. everybody listen to very bad wizards and don't listen to the weinsteins <laughs> for medical advice um but do listen for entertainment and, every so often not and, every week and for gauge theory and that for gauge good. theory yeah cute that's how we should, end. <laughs> yeah. we should end everything for gauge theory <laughs> <laughs>